G'day and welcome to the program, I'm Connor Duffy. Environmentalists say it's as pristine as the Great Barrier Reef, but it's now the target of oil and gas projects. The federal government has called for expressions of interest in offshore oil and gas right next to a protected reef in Western Australia. The Rowley Shoals are in one of the most remote parts of the country and green groups fear any drilling could destroy them. The secrets of Rowley Shoals have remained hidden to all but a small number of divers able to make the 260 kilometre boat ride from Broome until now. It's kind of an Attenborough moment when you, when you look at this footage and really appreciate how special this place is. Home to hundreds of species of coral, as well as sharks and large reef fish, its isolation has meant protection. Well, the Rowley Shoals are one of the most um, pristine, one of the healthiest atoll systems in Australia and indeed in the world. Now an intruder looms large. The federal government has called for expressions of interest in oil and gas projects, a move that could see seismic activity and drilling just three nautical miles away. An oil spill, even a small spill within a few kilometres of a place like this, which is so healthy, so pristine, could be devastating. Rowley Shoals is currently being considered for inclusion in a new network of marine parks. The government says this and its ecological values were noted with a request for expressions of interest and that any successful bidder will have to have an environmental plan assessed by regulators prior to undertaking any seismic or drilling activity. The state government says the acreage release is in Commonwealth waters and it only found out about it through the ABC. Rolly Shoals being one of the most iconic areas from what I've been advised uh, on the coastline of Western Australia, we would, would obviously have concerns if there was any impact on that particular pristine environment. Woodside says it'll start work on another development 10 kilometres from the reef next year. Attempts are being made to fill the gaps in a global study of the world's oceans. A career sailor is taking his yacht to remote destinations to deploy ocean monitoring robots while dodging the threat of piracy. Fiona Blackwood reports. Captain Peter Flanagan has spent 48 years at sea. It's given me a really good laugh and this is my payback. His payback is to deploy robotic floats in places where commercial and research ships don't visit. We are under sail power. We're not putting a lot of um, CO2 into the ocean uh, and we can reach places a lot cheaper than they can. Last year he released 60 floats. Captain Flanagan and his crew will now head to the Indian Ocean to release six more of the devices which measure temperature and salinity. And by measuring these things we, um, we can get an idea of how fast climate is going to change. The key to the success of the International Argo project is ensuring 3,000 floats are maintained across the globe. But piracy means parts of the ocean are now off-limits. A quarter of the Indian Ocean actually is almost close to, to ocean observation. Pirates are also a problem in the seas off Somalia. The US and Australian Navy have come to the rescue, deploying floats in some dangerous areas. From battleships to yachts, every float dropped overboard contributes to better understanding the world's oceans. A group of the nation's top scientists has come out swinging against the draft Murray-Darling Basin Plan. They say it fails to achieve key environmental goals and fails to consider climate change. The remarks were made as political opposition to the plan ramps up. Professor Richard Kingsford has spent decades studying the Murray-Darling system. He feels his and other scientists' knowledge has been left out of the debate. Now more than 60 colleagues from across the country say the plan to cut entitlements to irrigators by 2,750 gigalitres lacks transparency. I guess the concern is uh, what happened to the 3,000 to 4,000 gigalitres and in particular what the environmental benefits were of that and what environmental benefits are going to be lost. He says it's a once in a generation chance to ensure the health of the country's most important river system. I think we really owe it to the Australian community and also to future generations to get this one right. The scientists are extremely critical of the decision to leave climate change out of the plan, saying the basin could be 10% drier by 2030. I think it's a disaster. We know that the climate is changing and that in Australia 
Future climate change will mean that there is still less water available for everyone. The political row over the plan continues. New South Wales has joined South Australia in opposing the plan, though for the opposite reason. Our argument is we don't think there should be any more um, reductions in uh, draw from the river, particularly after the floods we've had, uh, uh, and we've put forward a submission to the Murray-Darling Basin Commission authority that uh, sets out all those details. A short-sighted argument, say the scientists. If there's one thing we know about our Australian environment, it's going to have droughts and floods. So this flood will be followed by another drought. Once the province of community schemes, car sharing is becoming a growing business that's changing the face of transport in the city. It provides an alternative to owning a car. Drivers pay a membership fee and then an hourly rate to use on demand. Supporters say its twin environmental and financial benefits mean it's increasing in popularity, as Emily Stewart reports. We're here in Southbank, a highly populated area in the city of Melbourne. Residents have many options for getting around, but a growing number of them are turning to sharing cars rather than owning them. Bruce Jeffries founded GoGet in 2003 with just three cars and 12 members. It's since grown to a fleet of 800 and 18,000 members. It's still a relatively new industry uh, and as, as it grows we see it servicing more and more, uh, more and more parts of our cities. Suits city living because um, I think we worked out that you know, owning a car through um, you know, petrol, uh, maintenance, parking um, and even having it just a garaging it is quite difficult so this was a really good alternative for us. Car sharing took off around 20 years ago in Germany and Switzerland but it's since spread around the world. I think it's a, it's a question of money. Uh, it's a high investment you have to take if you want a, an, own, an own car but if you take a look at Freiburg where I come from we got uh, let's say almost one-third cyclists and a lot of them don't need a car, they, they cycle to work and everywhere and uh, once they want to uh, go somewhere else with their family they, they rent a car, but it's cheaper if you do car sharing. Public-private partnerships are key to the success of the three car sharing companies that operate in Australia. Local councils provide the car spaces on the street and in car parks and in the central business district these car parks can be worth tens of thousands of dollars a year. We support car sharing because it's an alternative to owning cars and, and congestion is a big issue in, in big cities and, and it is in the city of Melbourne and anything we can do to reduce the number of cars on our streets is really important. Planning departments now encourage new residential and commercial developments to build smaller car parks and include car spaces for car sharing companies instead. We um, conducted research with people who had taken up car sharing or had used car sharing and the evidence showed that I think it was about 19%, almost 20% of people who used car share ditched or you know, sold their, their first car um, and I think it was almost 10% then so, or sold their second car as well. Now car sharing or cycling are no, more, no longer the enemies of the cars or the car companies. And fast making friends here. Certainly, you know, it means that um, the streets aren't cluttered with, with other vehicles when they don't need to be. And parking is never an issue. Sydney has signed on for what's been billed as the country's first citywide low carbon energy network. It will see coal fired power replaced with a cleaner, greener system. Sydney's Lord Mayor says it'll roughly halve the city's emissions and lead to cheaper power bills. These tri-generation engines will power the Lord Mayor's energy revolution. This is a very historic day for us. Running on natural gas initially, and then renewable energy, tri-generation is twice as efficient as traditional power plants. Two-thirds of the energy at coal-fired power plants is usually wasted. Tri-generation gets its name by using this excess power for heating and cooling. Sydney's tri-generation energy network will provide consumers with a cleaner, cost-competitive alternative to inefficient and highly polluting coal-fired power plants. The man driving the creation of the new city network says tri-generation engines will be stored in basements or on roofs. Hot water will be distributed by underground pipes. It will then be used or converted to chilled water for air conditioning. That is a huge move forward from only a few years ago to coming off the coal-fired grid, which has, I dare say, huge um, political significance as well as community significance. 
All up, it'll cost $440 million. Today, the Lord Mayor and Origin Energy put pen to paper on a deal that'll see Origin kickstart the program with a $100 million investment. The energy giant hopes it'll reduce the strain on the network. You avoid the costs and losses involved in transporting energy over long distances. The Lord Mayor says the scheme will provide some relief to Sydney's long-suffering electricity consumers. A study by the University of Technology Sydney found the city's investment could save New South Wales electricity consumers $1.5 billion. The city says work will begin next year, but it isn't due to finish until 2030, so the saving may be some way off. A CSIRO team has set sail on a 10-day, $2 million voyage to try to crack the secrets of the East Australian Ocean Current. The team says its research could be used by everyone from surfers to commercial fishermen. I caught up with the scientists on the eve of their departure. This small ship is preparing for a journey to tap a hidden underwater world. Let's go, man. Scientists say the East Australian current is as influential on thousands of kilometres of ocean and coastline as the wind is on land. This is a, a measurement that we've really uh, wanted to have for, for a long time and either technically or um, logistically we haven't been able to do it. The team will deploy five deep ocean moorings, measuring temperature, salinity and current strength from the coast to about two kilometres offshore. The deepest ones are four and a half thousand metres the inshore ones we have for 1,500 and um, 2,000 metres. The markers will remain underwater for two years. The data will then inform ocean modelling used by fishermen, surfers and even swimmers worried about the cold. It'll also have applications on land. The team hope to learn more about how ocean currents influence onshore temperatures. All of that eastern seaboard interacts with the uh, the EAC as it moves southwards in, you know, not just using it as, um, as for swimming in and surfing in, but it also as that m moderator of climate. The southern surveyor could become a marine trailblazer. And that's all for this edition of the program. Don't forget you can follow me on Twitter at Connor Duffy ABC and you can keep up with all the latest environment news at ABC Online, abc.net.au slash environment. See you next time.